Um, good afternoon, everyone. We're, uh, we're really humbled that you t are taking time out of your uh, DrupalCon schedule to uh, attend this one. Um, just continuing on along the lines of what Michael was asking, a quick straw poll, how many um, are sole practitioners? Maybe just have one or one person consultancy? Okay. How many, maybe one to 10 employees? 10 to 25? 10 to 25, okay. And uh, 25 or higher, 50 more, more? Okay, great. That helps give some context. There's a few more open seats up here if anyone wants to come in. And just so everyone knows, they are trying to record the session, so even though we probably don't need the mic, they are asking us to use it. So if you see Michael and I passing the mic or coming behind the podium, um, uh, that's why. So, all right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. The title of the session is Understanding the Critical Metrics for Your Drupal Business. Um, this is the least favorite part of the presentation because we're forced to talk about ourselves, but I think one of the um, unique differentiators uh, for Michael and I presenting the session is that um, we're active owner operators in Drupal centric agencies. So I know um, a lot of times when you're given advice, it's from the author of a book or a consultant who may not be actively involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a Drupal business. So um, we do want to give you some framework around the lens that we're looking at some of the issues through. So for Media Current, um, we're a bit of a hybrid. Um, the majority of our team is distributed across 23 states. We hire all US-based W-2 full-time employees. We have an operations team that's based in Atlanta. Um, I am a co-founder and partner, have been involved with the Drupal community since 2007. This is my ninth um, DrupalCon North America, and it's um, always great to be able to share and give back. Um, I was also very active um, for a long time in the regional Drupal community in the southeast, um, and was a primary organizer for Drupal Camp Atlanta. If anyone would like to talk shop um, the rest of the week or have us go more in depth about a particular topic, um, we'd be more than happy to do that. I'm really passionate about um, sales and marketing and just open source software and, and culture and um, those types of topics. And um, hopefully we'll have enough time in the end for Q&A. We really want to listen to, um, again, continuing to what Michael was saying, you know, covering what you want to hear in terms of subject matter. So we have a ton of uh, data points and content that we're going to be covering uh, with you today. And I'm going to let Michael kind of segue over, introduce himself, and continue. Hi. We do have like four or five single seats up front here if you guys want to find a seat. But I'm Michael Silverman. I think this presentation kind of grew out of the fact that you know Dave says he's happy to talk and share about this stuff. We've been doing this for years, so I think the idea here was, okay, some of the stuff that I think we figured out are the right metrics for a business, let's try and share them. So myself, I've got about 30 years in business. I started um, Duo in 2009, so I've been doing that business for um, just going on 17 years now, which is seemingly like a long time. And we went all Drupal as a company in 2009. I've probably been coming to Drupal cons, I think this is probably my sixth. Um, so I founded Duo 99. So Duo, um, we're about 25 people in Chicago. Um, other, uh, unlike Dave, we basically had everybody coming into the office every day. Duo's been changing because we now um, have an investment and an affiliate with a, a firm in India. So we're sort of um, going to a hybrid model. And I can talk about that a little bit. But uh, just from where this is coming from is, is Duo's been around, about that size, 25 to 35 people over the last decade or so, you're about double that size. About 65. Yeah. You're distributed. We're, we have everyone coming into the office. Um, but otherwise, we're pretty much all Drupal-focused. So these are the um, 
areas that we wanted to cover. So we, we tried to pick out a number of different items that we thought were key areas to focus on as business people. We're going to give, be giving them somewhat short shrift because we're only spending five minutes or so on each one. But uh, let's go and do it. So I'm starting out by really saying that before you figure out what, how well you're doing, you need to figure out if you know where you're going. So you got to know where you're going and then keep your eyes on the dashboard. And that's what a lot of this is about, is, is knowing what your goal is. So what is the goal of the business? Are you looking to grow the business? You know, I wasn't really looking to grow Duo much larger than it became when I started the company for various reasons. Um, you probably were looking for a fair amount of growth and have probably grown, yep. I mean, you're five years younger than us and twice our size. So, so knowing where you want to end up is really the key point to start. And um, there's so many good books, business books, that we'll be recommending some of them today. Um, good to Great by Jim Collins is, is one of these sort of books that everybody reads. It's a great book. It has a lot of, of good things to cover. And there's so many great books. Um, that what I got into was this um, by Vern Harnish, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. So what Vern Harnish did is he kind of took all the best practices from all of the latest business books of the last 10, 15 years and put them into kind of an operating system for a small business. And he called it the Rockefeller Habits. And one of the outcomes of this um, structure is that you have something called a one-page plan. It's actually two sides of a page. But uh, the one-page plan is going to start out by, you know, what are the core values and, and the purpose of the company. And you notice here where it says targets three to five years. So it's asking you to look out three to five, maybe seven, maybe ten, kind of depends on where you are in your career, of where do you want to be? Where do you want to be when you grow up? Where are you heading to? And then you break that down to, okay, where do I need to be three years out? Where do I need to be one year out? And then where do I need to be every quarter? So that's how this operating system works. There's a couple different ways to look at these different operating systems, but they basically say begin with the end in mind. And many other books talk about this. Understand where you want to go. So both Dave and I have recently also had sort of exits or the ability to sort of exit from the company or in the process. And um, um, that's also part of what you need to consider at this point if that is a, a goal for you. So Rockefeller Habits is a great book on this. There's a guy that worked with Vern on Rockefeller Habits and wrote his own book called Traction. I kind of like the Traction book as well. Um, it's a little bit more of a, of a, of a storyline, but it's really the same ideas, the same kind of one-page plan and focus. And then another tool that you might want to do is join a group like Vistage or EO. EO is the Entrepreneurs Organization. But if you can get together with a group of CEOs or, or you know, business people within your area, usually these groups are eight to ten people and you sort of share um, best practices with each other, it, it, it helps to reinforce a lot of the things that are coming out of these books. So we wanted to um, purposely start out with culture because um, both Michael and I believe that culture is truly the only competitive, sustainable advantage any of us in this room have. So. Um, a very popular topic lately in the business world. Um, how many are familiar with Simon Sinek? So, yeah, maybe 25%. So Simon Sinek um, has done one of the top five, I think now, most popular TED Talks in the world. Um, so for some of you, this is gonna be reinforcement. Um, for most of you, it will be new. So Simon Sinek in this TED Talk talks about a theory called the Golden Circle. And he says that most companies can tell you what they do. So if I asked many of you in the room what you do, you could tell me that you do development, you do design, you do strategy. Most companies can also articulate how they do it. So many of us on a website probably have that same you know, flywheel diagram that shows we do discovery and a define phase and then design and um, it looks pretty similar. Where companies really struggle is telling you why they do what they do. What's the purpose of the company? What makes you tick? What makes your employees want to come and work for you? Um, and Cynic has um, some great metaphorical references. One that I really love is um, many of us have heard the story of um, the Wright brothers. And um, 
the Wright brothers originally from Ohio. I think they moved to Kitty Hawk, uh, North Carolina. They were tinkerers, they were engineers, but um, Cynic says they really had this idea that they could revolutionize the way that we thought about the transportation industry. But what he says is that a lot of people didn't know is that in parallel to the Wright brothers was the government funding a pretty elite team of Harvard engineers with unlimited funding, unlimited resources, and they had all of the, again, um, resources, budget at their disposal to work on a project that was very similar to the Wright brothers. And Cynic says, we all know kind of how the story ends. The Wright brothers are, I've seen it disputed a little bit lately, but are generally credited for getting the first, you know, plane off the ground and revolutionizing the way that we, you know, think about transportation. The, the guys at Harvard, the team at Harvard, was collecting a paycheck. They really didn't know the purpose of what it is that they were working on. So why am I telling you that? I think when you analogize that to your own agency or to open source software, it's pretty darn exciting to think when Michael and I were first starting 2007, 2009, how few people had even heard of open source software. Only about 20% of um, organizations in the world even use a CMS. So um, we have the ability, we feel like at Media Current, to really revolutionize the way people think about um, software and the open web. And that's pretty exciting to think about the impact that our work has on organizations. So um, the recommendation, the takeaway is make sure you have a mission and a purpose at your agency and you're able to articulate that to your employees. That's one of the first things that we do at Media Current um, from day one forward. So, Again, this is um, us looking at things through the prism of a distributed team model. But in terms of su suggestions on how do you strengthen your culture, these are some things that we do. I'd highly encourage you to do um, an end of the year survey. Um, for us, we've been doing it three years and it's great to get you know, a sampling of seeing where from the employee's eyes we're improving or maybe where we're um, dropping off. Um, we do for our leadership team quarterly KPIs. Um, every week at Media Current during our staff meeting, we do a knowledge share. So we'll pick um, somebody's favorite topic. It could be about a module that they learned. It could be um, about financial planning, but um, we're really trying to share knowledge across the company every week. Um, we have a 24 by seven anonymous suggestion box. That's so easy to implement. It's a simple Google you know, template, but really surprised how many organizations don't do it. Some of our best ideas have come from employees that have given us um, some good thoughts through this suggestion box. We do organized team building events. Um, we schedule a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, try to find out you know, what is the morale of the company. Um, and I know there's tools that you can do that, but for us, it's not a substitute for actually being able to have you know, good communication and one-on-one -on -one time with our team. We do an annual company retreat, um, being virtual, again, being primarily distributed. We feel it's really important to get everyone together in the same room um, at least once a year. We have a $2,500 continuing education stipend. Um, one of the core parts of Media Current's culture is making sure that we are helping our team professionally grow and develop. So um, what we have heard from a lot of other, um, some other agencies or companies is they'll say they encourage professional development and growth, but they don't always you know, put their money where their mouth is. They don't sort of, you know, if they're asked to, if they ask a manager to attend, you know, a conference or a Drupal camp, they might be given, you know, pushback or resistance. So um, we encourage um, continuing learning. That's a big part of our um, culture. We have, uh, we use Slack for um, communication as our primary communication tool. So um, we feel that it's also important to have, be able to have private 
um, discussion groups. Maybe you like, um, you know, have a book club or um, a certain movie interest, and um, we have private Slack channels that people can join for that. Um, one of the suggestions that we got recently was um, we don't feel like we have enough visibility into you know what's going on at Media Current. We'd love to hear more announcements, and we also incorporated um, doing public praise for employees that are doing um, an above and beyond effort. Um, so that's something we recently implemented, and we archive all of those company announcements every week. Um, we also do once a month um, at a minimum for people who have, um, for um, employees who are in um, a state with multiple employees, we will formally set up a co-working day for them to um, just be able to, you know, get out of their house, break the monotony, break the routine. So these are some of the things that um, we do at Media Current. So I mentioned um, Simon Sinek, highly encourage. It's a seven or eight minute talk. Um, it was pretty real eye-opening for me when I first saw it a year or two, and um, it's, a, it's a really, really good speech. The other that has had a lot of influence on um, me personally, as well as, um, I think Michael has read the book as well, is Daniel Pink and Drive. I'll share one quick um, story out of Drive that, you know, Daniel Pink's basic um, theory is very aligned with Simon Sinek. He says that um, employees generally aren't motivated by money. And he gives a really neat example of a restaurant. And the restaurant was a franchise. They looked at two line cooks, two cooks who performed pretty much the exact same duties and responsibilities and had the, about the same amount of experience. They made, one, they made two subtle differences. They paid one of the line cooks 30% more, 20 to 30%, I forget the exact increment. Um, they paid him more, and then the other cook, um, they'd made a subtle change to the back of the restaurant. They set up a TV monitor, and they set up a camera system for different tables within the restaurant, and he could see people eating his food that he was preparing in the back of the restaurant. So Daniel Pink says, guess who has higher retention in the restaurant that implemented that simple strategy? And it's about purpose, right? The line cook was able to see the results of what he was doing, and um, the person who was making more money was more likely to turn over. So great books. Um, that's a couple of recommended resources on culture. Yeah, culture really is, is important. It's really um, one of the key differentiators, especially as we're all sort of chasing the same talent pool. So it's something that you definitely want to focus on. And I think there's um, different things that you need to do if you're a distributed organization versus local. Now, if you're going to keep operating, though, you need to have gross profit. So one of the first metrics that I'm covering is really gross profit. Um, just briefly to mention something about financial statements, I'm, I'm really looking at the profit and loss or the income statement. You might do these on an accrual basis. You might do these on a cash basis. Depending on the structure of your business, you, you, you might essentially just be doing cash um, financials because that is what you need to pay taxes against. But you really should be looking at accrual, um, which is sort of your operating financials within a month, and that's where many of these metrics are going to be coming from. Um, the gross profit target that I think you really need to hit, if, especially with um, all onshore resources, is going to be about 50%. And when I talk about gross profit, I just want to be very clear. I think that a lot of time these metrics get passed around, but you need to know exactly how people are calculating these metrics. So when I talk about gross profit, what you want to do is you want to take your sort of net operating revenue. So if you've got a lot of pass-through revenue, let's just say you're doing you know, a lot of SEO work and Google advertising, so you're collecting money from your clients and giving it to Google. Um, 
obviously that is revenue, but I'm not counting that revenue. So I have total revenue here on the top of 120,000, which might be the total revenue. Take away that pass-through revenue, where you're really just not providing a whole lot of, of, of added service there. And that means that your actual revenue for services provided would be, say, $100,000. Um, 100 percent cost of services would be the variable cost of providing those services. So the people, all the costs that are involved primarily for organizations like us, it would be people that are used to provide those services. Most of your um, tech, you know, accounting systems can, can manage this for you, and you can look at it project by project and person by person. But overall, as an aggregate, um, you don't really want your variable costs to exceed 50% of your revenue if you want to be profitable. So pass-through cost is money that you're kind of collecting from your customer and paying to a vendor and not really adding value. So the example I used was buying Google AdWords for people. If they're, say, giving you $5,000 a month and you're, and you're spending that on Google, okay, the consulting services to figure out which AdWords to buy would fall into your consulting revenue. But the pass-through money, like, you know, we spent five grand on Google and we collected five grand for that from the customer, that would be the pass-through costs. So I'm really looking at your operating costs, 50% gross margin for any services that you're providing. And don't fool yourself with those pass-through costs. Um, sometimes it makes you think you're a bigger business than you are, and you might not make um, the right decisions because of it. What I'm showing here is if you've got 50% margin, operating costs usually shouldn't exceed 30%, so you've got a chance of hitting 20% gross, which is a nice target to shoot for. So segueing over to sales. Um, again, this could be an entire session on itself, and we're going to try to give you a brain dump on and just some key pointers. Um, so tools that we use, I know, slap my um, hand, we don't use Sugar, we do use Salesforce um, as our CR, CRM. Um, we use something called a Gecko board um, as a software. I'll show you a screenshot later of what a, a Gecko board looks like. For proposals, we still use um, Google templates for, we've, um, for estimates um, in collaboration. Still find that it's a viable tool um, for that. So some suggestions. Um, if there's one thing that you take away that's critical to sales, it's around, it should be around positioning. I'm going to go into a little bit more in depth in that in a second, but positioning is critical. If you're at the business summit the um, other day, I threw out a few acronyms, but one thing that we try to be cognizant of on every sales call is qualifying and learning about BANT. BANT is an acronym for budget, authority, need, timeline. So any time that you talk to a prospect, you should be establishing what it is that their budget is, who's the authority or the decision maker to be able to approve the sale, what's the need, what's the pain point, what kind of problems are they trying to solve, and is there a time-bound element to the engagement to the initiative? You know, is this a must-have project or a nice-to-have? So BANT. Um, establishing MLOEs. MLOE is a... Maybe one of those things, Dave, where if they can't give you the answers to the BANT, it's not really a prospect? Yeah, I, we, um, so budget is always the tough one, right? Because you're going to ask for budget, and then there's this back and forth and tug of war. Nobody wants to give the first number. Um, but I would, if the, the prospect's afraid, if they give you a number, you're going to come in a dollar under it, right? Um, so budget is probably the hardest one. Um, I'm an advocate of um, trying to establish ranges. So um, if you come out and say, is it 100 to 200,000, is that the range that you have in mind? Um, and try to bracket the best um, that you can. Um, Establish MLOEs is minimum level of engagement. One of the big mistakes we made early on at Media Current is we were trying to be everything to everyone when it came to sales. We were going to user group meetings. We were well-intentioned. There was a small business who needed Drupal help, um, and they just weren't a good fit for the type of service offerings um, and the type of value that we could provide. So um, establishing that minimum level of engagement for us, it's a six month term and the minimum is uh, 20 hours a month. I was so, surprised when I heard that from Dave because they're twice our size 
and our minimum engagement <coughs> Okay, so I was surprised that he's, he'll come in and I assume take over existing sites, mm -hmm. right? Like a 20 hour a month mm -hmm. um, support. And 20 hours a month is what? That's like two and a half man days in a month. So that's pretty small. Yep. Sorry, what was your minimum? Well, what's our minimum? Yeah. I mean, you look at it in a couple ways, right? So I would say at a project minimum, we, we are probably 50, 60,000. I mean, I like to keep it above that. And, uh, but also we do take in clients for um, ongoing services and support, maybe from a vendor they were unhappy with or, or something like that. And um, our minimum engagement started at 24 hours. So I was just, I was kind of surprised when you told me 20. <laughs> exactly. So I want to illustrate the importance of positioning um, through um, the airline industry, of all verticals, right? The airline industry. So positioning. Um, I'm, I'm picking on uh, United because Michael's from Chicago, but I, I literally could have chosen um, any probably airline to, to plug in here. And a lot of people will remember um, post 9-11 just the amount, I'm from Atlanta, busiest airport in the world, and always when I walk through the um, airport, how many airlines were going out of business, consolidating, merging, going bankrupt. Um, it was a very tumultuous time in the 2000s for the airline industry. And a lot of um, you know, consultants, uh, pundits began to research. There was one airline though that sort of stayed profitable, stayed, stayed sustainable, and was able to persevere through the airline industry. Only one, and it was Southwest Airlines. And they started to look at how was Southwest different from Delta or United or all these other airlines. And they looked at United, and United would serve every kind of destination. They would serve every kind of traveler, first class, uh, economy. They would offer every class of service. They would operate many different aircraft. Um, and they were unprofitable um, for most of the past decade. I think they've recently emerged from bankruptcy and are doing better. But when you compare that, you contrast that to Southwest Airlines. Um, if you've ever flown Southwest, you know they only go to well-traveled destinations. They only serve one kind of traveler. Um, they only offer one class of service. They only operate one kind of aircraft. So they became specialists at doing what they know, um, and they've been profitable again every year. When I compared that to the business model that we were trying to establish at Media Current, um, we've been tempted, like probably many of you, during peaks and valleys and times in sales, to become like United, right? Become more of a generalist. But we stayed down a path to singularly focus exclusively in um, Drupal. We want to offer, um, like Southwest and some of the other you know, companies that are known for customer service, we want to op um, offer a really high bar when it comes to customer service. And most successful organizations like Southwest um, aren't afraid to be a little different. You know, Southwest commercials around, you know, baggage fees and, um, you know, constantly trying to think about different ways to improve or improvise. And we try to take that same, you know, approach and mentality at Media Current. And I'm proud to say, you know, we've been profitable for um, nine consecutive years, really from day one. We've had double digit percentage growth. So I'm sharing with you metrics that we actually use in our company State of the Union. So if, um, again, part of the hope, what we were hoping you'd get out of this session, and we will share this in the end, um, is for you to be able to compare things like, how are we finding new business? Um, why were we selected for a project? Um, how many new clients did we help adopt onto Drupal? Um, so again, we'll share this in the end. We also look at where are we seeing the most industry or vertical momentum. I think um, if you were at the Acquia Summit, they, valid they validated some of this. We're seeing a really big spike um, in higher ed. Um, our conversion rate, this surprises some people, um, is only 26%. Um, 
That is somebody who we decided to engage in a conversation with, and we didn't win the deal for whatever reason. One of the reasons we lose a lot of deals because is because of the upper right. Um, we require some kind of discovery, typically, so we have a well-defined set of requirements, and if the prospect is unwilling to do that, then um, we'll turn away the project. So we have about a 20, again, 26% conversion rate. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the question was, did we set ourselves a target for conversion rates? Um, we'd like it to be probably a, a third, um, 33%, um, but the higher, the better. I'll talk about conversions in the marketing segment, though, too. Recommended resources. Um, I'm a big advocate. I like um, the Sandler methodology, the Sandler model. I will say it's going to be a little bit hit or miss. They are a franchise. Some locations are much better than others. We'll reinforce good to great um, Jim Collins' book. There's a consultant, Michael and I. Um, Michael's going to, has talked a lot more um, to him than I have, but they're both sort of out of the same camp called Blair Ends, E N N S. Um, Blair is really big around how you win um, deals without ever answering an RFP. So he has a really great perspective um, that I found very intriguing. And Stephen Covey, Seven Hi Habits of Highly Effective People, which a lot of people have probably heard of. There's a lot in this section um, to comment on. Blair, I'm smiling because Blair talks a lot about positioning too. If you guys could maybe come in in the back and we could shut the door, I'm hearing some noise from that other one. Just sneak up the sides or something here, come on in. Um, so the positioning, you know, one thing I'll say with the positioning is you, you definitely need to go narrow. It's really hard to do positioning because you're turning away business. And especially in the early years of business, you kind of want to take everything that you can get. But I, I think it is one of the most important things to um, draw a line in the sand on. And it does take a few years before it'll really take hold. So if you want to switch your positioning every few years, you're, you're, you're chasing a moving target. Um, Blair did write this book, Win Without Pitching. Um, and, and he's really against answering RFP. So I'm like, well, what if, you know, part of your positioning, you're going after, say, the higher ed market, where there's always RFPs. And he said, pick another market, OK? So um, but you gotta, you got to get the sales out there. Um, once you got the sales out there, you got to be able to staff right to support those sales. So that's the big utilization question. And to me, this is actually the, um, the key to sort of business and business profitability. It's, it, it surprises me when, when I'm talking to prospects because, you know, it seems to oftentimes be all about the rates, you know, what's your blended rate or what are your rates versus other people's rates. But it's really sort of efficiency with how you get the work done that I think we all know as business owners that makes, you know, is really the most important thing. Um, so utilization, I'm really talking about company-wide utilization. I've got a picture here of Dave Baker. He speaks a lot in this area. And if you're unfamiliar with him, I put up recourses.com, which is his site. Got his, he, he's really smart. He's not very personable and not very friendly, um, but he's really smart. And he works with, you know, maybe six, 700 different agencies. Maybe 100 of them are, say, interactive agencies where we would fall. And then he compares metrics against best practices. So this is where the utilization is coming from. And, you know, we're looking for utilization on a company-wide level at 70% or higher. Okay? Now, let me talk to you about company-wide level. You, you can look at, say, revenue per employee. This is another way to do it. Um, it's just another way to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So if you've got, say, a 10-person company and, say, you know, seven of those people are billable, okay, so that 10-person company, um, if it does 1.6 million, uh, you divide the 1.6 million by the 10 people, not just the billable people, and get about 160,000 ahead. The numbers that I hear in this area are maybe 160 to 180 are what you really need to look for for every person in your company. So if it's much lower than that, you've got too many people in your company and you probably have too much overhead, okay? Um, with utilization, you know, a highly productive worker can maybe, can generate 16, 1700 billable hours in a year. That's, that's about what both of us are getting out of highly productive 
workers if we're able to keep them busy. Some organizations, I understand, actually get about 2,000 hours a year billable, and maybe they're at the 85% level. Um, this, I got this from um, one, of, one of Dries's articles. I don't see, frankly, how they're able to do that um, unless people are just constantly working more than you know, 40, 45 hours a week. So what you want to do is you want to take the total number of billable hours that you generate, billable hours, not internal projects, okay, not cost overages that you didn't charge for, okay, total number of billable hours um, for the time period. So let's say there's 1,700, you know, for a, a staff of, uh, let's say a staff of 15 people, 12 of which are billable. So I take the 12 billable people times the 1,700 hours, get say 20,000 hours. Then you take the total number of employees and you're gonna multiply that by around 2,000 hours per employee. That's sort of the theoretical maximum. We use 1920, which is based on 40 hours a week and 48 weeks. So the denominator doesn't change. I don't change this number if somebody goes on vacation. All right, so I'm taking the numerator, which is the billable hours, divided by the denominator. I'm including every person in the company, and that's where you wanna be above 70%. And I'll tell you, I spent about five years just trying to figure out utilization because everyone talks about it differently. Um, you can calculate it differently and just stick with that and go with it, but it's, it's really important to uh, look at this number to see how you're staffing if you want to be profitable. Sorry, 12 is people who are billing, Yes. Okay. So for this example, we're looking at maybe a, um, you know, a million six company and something like that. Um, so yes. You want at least 70% utilization when you're counting every person in the organization. You take every person in the organization, basically count 40 hours a week times, say, 48 weeks. That's where you get 1960. Then you take the billable hours. Okay, for the people that bill. So it's probably going to be less than everyone, but the people that bill, total that up. And you can do this for a month. You can do this for a year. I'm using year numbers here. But it's a really critical number to work. So next topic is recruiting, um, and we, um, looking at the time, we want to make sure we cover all the subject matter. So some of this we may gloss over, but definitely want to leave time in the end for questions. So um, recruiting tip, one of the, these are just, again, suggestions, um, things that we leverage at, at Media Current. Um, one of the bigger mistakes that we've seen um, newer agencies make especially is um, they're looking for that silver bullet. They almost have that slot machine mentality when it comes to recruiting. What do I mean by that? If I post that one job on a Drupal job board or LinkedIn, I sit back with a catcher's mitt on and try to wait for resumes to come in. You know, stop doing that. And recruiting is um, I don't have a secret honey hole. Michael doesn't, where we can go and tell you to find, you know, great talent that nobody else knows about. Um, recruiting is really just a concerted effort. If there's one thing I would say to focus on, it's incorporating and networking into your week to try to find um, great um, people. And for us, employer referrals have been the number one source for hiring the last four or five years. Um, I get asked this a lot, like, um, so what if we don't have the immediate um, sales to support a great person? Would you recommend hiring them even though you don't have the production to necessarily keep them at the capacity that you need? My recommendation would be yes. Don't bypass great people because you don't have the immediate need. You should try to align you know, finding that person and rectifying and leveling off um, later if you have an opportunity to find somebody, um, hire them. Um, don't skip reference checking. Really surprised how people um, take for granted that every reference is going to be good anyway, so I don't need to check references. We have a very formal reference checking process. We require at least one of the references to be a former manager or direct supervisor of the person. Um, of course, when we talk about recruiting, you have to do a lot less recruiting if you're able to retain great people and you have low turnover. Um, the key for um, really retention for us is going back to what I said about um, professional growth and development. It's taking a vested interest in your team's success. Um, and then we also 
The first 90 days, I think first impressions are critical. We have a three-day onboarding where everyone in the company comes to Atlanta. Um, we then do a formal checkpoint at 45 days, and we do another check-in at 90 days. Again, we're wanting to make sure they're getting assimilated, they're getting effectively onboarded. Yeah, so that's coming up next. Yep, so um, tools quickly that we use. I'm not, we don't get any kickbacks, Michael and I, from these tools. This is just what we use. Um, we like Jazz, okay. I think the name used to be Resumator. Um, we use DISC for personality testing, um, operations people like sales. I'm in the process now of evaluating a tool for employee reviews called Perform Yard. Um, this is a sample. The, the gentleman was asking what um, is an example of questions that we ask for the check-in. So I know this is small print. Again, we're going to send you the deck, but um, this is just you know an example of the template that we use to do the 45-day check-in. You know, are you familiar with the company's business model? Do you know how to um, file PTO? Silly sounds. Do you know who you report to? You know, these are just questions that we want to validate during, you know, the check-in. Recommended resources. It's about 10-year-old book now, but top grading is one that um, I really like. And then this is a, a, an example chart of what a DISC um, profile looks like, and we could talk about more that later. Are you using DISC for everyone or just for sales? Just for um, operations, yeah, sales. Just, just for sales? Primarily. And, I, and when he mentioned, um, you know, employ, using your employees for recruiting, it's really the best source. Um, we both pay a, a bounty on that. I think thousand dollars. Yep, we do do a yeah. yep, referral so, bonus. Ours is a thousand. So we're both paying a thousand dollar referral bonus. I actually went to two thousand dollars for referral bonuses for a bit, and then I realized that a thousand was enough to make my point. Um, I think with a number like that. Um, it's not like people, you know, want the money so bad, but it kind of keeps it top of mind and they really think about people for recruiting. Um, I also find the camps are kind of good for recruiting because, mm -hmm. you, you know, the people that maybe come to the camps are, are maybe different than the people that will come to the cons. All right, labor efficiency is my next metric. So this is kind of a little bit more of an advanced metric, but we use it and I kind of like it. It, it sort of looks at utilization, but remember when I talked about utilization, I talked about it on a company level, and we're really looking at, say, you know, one thing that that will tell us is if we have too much overhead relative to our, our number. So this idea of um, LER, um, labor efficiency ratio, it comes from a guy named Craig, Greg Crabtree, who wrote this book, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk. And um, you're basically taking the revenue on an individual level and dividing it by their wages. So you don't have to figure in taxes or benefits. You're, you're looking at individual productivity here by looking at somebody's cost on the top, uh, um, revenue that they're generating on the top and their cost on the bottom, okay? And then the big thing here is that you're really looking at this over time. So, we would be looking at this, say, on a monthly basis. And just to give you an idea of how this number works, you know, let's just say you've got a developer that you're paying $80,000 to and they're generating 267000 This is, of course, annualized, just so it may seem a little more familiar. You just take the 267 over the 80 and you're at 3.34. So that's what these LER numbers are going to look like. It'll be, you know, 2, 3, 4, 1, something like that. So maybe an architect that costs more um, is, is generating a little bit more money, but they're costing more. So you can see how their LER is going to be lower. So you might, you know, it may be sort of your developers, in a sense, that have a higher LER, uh, unless you're able to get, say, higher price points for higher priced employees. Um, somebody like myself, who might bill very little, is going to have a very low LER. It's just the case. Um, a project manager, our project managers bill at around 50 percent, or that's sort of their goal. So their LER is going to be closer to one and a half than say two and a half. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at an individual person. And then what we do is we look at that metric over time. So I'm saying that you want your LER to be above 2.5. Now again, I'm not including people that are only a portion billable. I'm really looking at the billable people here. But it's, it is important that you look at this over time because how billable someone can do does depend on 
the work that's in house. So certainly in any single period, there might be somebody whose LER drops because they don't have billable work to do, say, that month. They're spending a couple weeks on the bench. But when you look at it over time, okay, so you look at the LER over time per employee, you can see, you know, who is on the bench more and who isn't. Because what I find is that kind of what I call the best employees, they tend to sort of the, attract the work and it comes to them and they can stay highly billable. And then I think you also have to take into account cost um, which is what this quotient comes in. And this, this comes in hand, handy so we can really see who's driving sort of the profitability through for the business. It helps me when I'm looking at raises for individuals um, and makes me understand you know, how to use my most expensive people. So next topic is um, on marketing. So um, just a few, again, tools and suggestions. We use at Media Current Pardot. Um, as mar for marketing automation. Yep. So one of the big reasons we ch chose Pardot in all honesty was the geographic proximity. They were headquartered in Atlanta, but we really, um, we really like Pardot. Probably the, the single most important marketing metric for us um, is conversions. So um, while we generate a lot of content, we want to make sure that content that's generating the leads is um, actually converting to Cus paying customers. So I would say make sure you, you become less focused on how much traffic your site's getting or how much how many uh, Twitter followers you have. What's really important is how many of those people are you converting to again actual customers. So I mentioned Gecko Board earlier. If you walked into Media Current's office, this would be on display. This is our actual monitor from I guess a few weeks ago. But we're tracking um, real-time results of uh, what kind of impact our content is having. This is just, again, from our company overview. Um, I see agencies make a lot of mistakes uh, around they will tell um, their employees, their team, that everybody should do sales. Um, we don't believe that philosophically. We feel that sales is a very separate skill set um, from those who do engineering or marketing or um, different areas of the company. What we do believe, though, is that everyone at Media Current is a marketer. Everyone can be engaged in creating content that helps with leads, and we track everything related to that. So. Last year, we blogged um, literally every two or three days, 126 blog posts. We published six ebooks. We did six things like video testimonials with customers. We drafted four case studies. We look at who are the most popular. So, some of you who um, are on the development side probably know Damian McKenna. He's probably one of the top 20 contributors to Drupal in the world. He was our top um, contributor last year. Um, at Media Current, um, we look at what kind of blog posts generate the most traffic. So for us, we have an employee who puts out a top 50 module list, um, a ton of exposure, a ton of visibility. We look at who's downloaded the most content. So um, those ebooks I mentioned, you know, which ones are, are getting the most exposure. So some recommendations. Um, you know, Content Marketing Auto Institute, Contagious. Um, Shameless plug, Michael has written a uh, book on um, community capturing forums, communities. Cap capturing communities. Um, so you can check out his book online as well on marketing. So we're both doing content marketing. I think that's important. Um, and we're both using the data and the results from the content marketing to sort of bet, do better marketing. OK, so I think content marketing is definitely a good way to go. I just wanted to go back here. top. Uh, on the top right there for you guys, organic search is 60% of where their traffic is coming from, and that's because of the content marketing that they're doing, and then they're moving them through the funnel to conversion. So if you're into this stuff, CMI, Content Marketing Institute, is a great place to learn more. They also put on an event called Content Marketing World. Um, HubSpot is writing like five times a day about this stuff. Recurring revenue, though. Um, if you're, as the marketing engine gets going, you know, we talked about the importance of getting new sales. Keeping the sales that you have, keeping the clients that you have for, for many years is really key. And 
Jim Collins talks about this in Good to Great. He talks about the flywheel, and as the flywheel gets moving, and for many of us, I think the flywheel is recurring revenue that comes from subscription services. In the early days of Duo, I used to put hosting into this category, and we used to do hosting for people, but it's really become relatively you know, commoditized. But having service agreements that with clients, we try, once a client finishes a project with us, we do try to get them involved with a service agreement where there's a set number of hours per month and it pretty much just recurs and renews every quarter, every year. And that is, um, the goal there I think is about to get about 40% of your revenue from recurring revenue, because that'll just about cover your nut then. So you really want to focus on that. Another goal you could have in mind is say a million dollars of recurring revenue. Okay, so that would be you're about a two million dollar business if, you know, forty percent, a million eight, whatever. So once you hit that goal, it it really makes it really changes the way I think you feel as far as security moving for, forward, as far as the business continuity. So can't emphasize enough focusing on that. So client services. Um, if you were at the Acquia event. Um, Something that they reinforced I found interesting, and I wish I had a, um, I could articulate this, but for whatever reason, it seems like after about five years of being at an agency, maybe the 30, 40 employee mark, net new logo growth and sales becomes much harder. Um, you begin to pivot to more of a land and expand model. So you're trying to um, generate more business from your existing accounts um, because it becomes harder to attract new newer customers. So. Um, some of the things that we do on the client services front, um, client health survey, we have a post-mortem template. Um, we'll have a welcome kit. So during the kickoff meeting, we'll make sure that there's a familiarity with the project team who's assigned to the client. Um, so we're trying to build you know, that strong partnership relationship from day one with the welcome kit. And I'm going to show you a screenshot of what that looks like for us. Um, suggestions of for establish a formal cadence of touch point. Uh, touch points creating credibility and trust by you know, adding value. This is something that um, Acquia talked a lot about as well. Everyone now is trying to um, become more full service, right? You can no longer um, land work um, in many cases if you're purely a hardcore Drupal development shop. You know, customers are demanding more, the buyer's becoming more sophisticated. Um, and one thing at MediaCurrent we try to emphasize is just we should understand our customers' problems better than them. That's just a um, philosophy you could think about. And one thing we did, I mentioned this at the Business Summit a couple of years ago that um, added a lot of value, was hire a third-party market research firm to gather unfiltered feedback. So a lot of times if you ask the customer in the middle of a project, hey, how's it going, um, they're not going to give you that unfiltered feedback like they would if it was done by a third party. This is the um, welcome kit I mentioned just with our sort of table of contents. Um, again, we'll, we'll share our information where you can get the, the slides. Recommended resources. Um, I think Michael and I are both a fan of uh, Zappos around um, customer service. If you've um, read any books or know anything about their culture, they have a very, uh, they have a lot of culture camps that they do, a lot of customer service workshops, so that would be one to look at. So finishing up with EBITDA, you got to have earnings. And what are the earnings? And um, what are you shooting for? So the earnings, EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So it's a standard accounting form. It's going to be the bottom line, the net income on your income statement. You can add back the, um, the uh, depreciation or amortization. You do need to kind of normalize owner salary here. So. It's hard to say what's normal for owner, owner salary. Um, what would you get paid if you were working elsewhere is one way you could answer the question. When I ask what owners uh, should be paid, the numbers always seemed higher than I was ever able to take out of the company myself. Um, but you really want to look at profits. I used to, you know, I used to think like, okay, we just, you know, want to make sure we're profitable and certainly paying me a salary. Um, the goal really is, is uh, you, you could hit 20%. I know Dave hits 20% profitability. Um, on an EBITDA basis, um, I don't want to say regularly, but he, 
He has. Duo hasn't been quite that profitable. For us, 10 percent is like the minimum that we're comfortable with. We're probably more in the 10 to 15 percent range. It may be a little bit different because of the distributed model versus the, the local model. Um, and then the, the valuation of your company is probably going to be about five to eight times that EBITDA number. And they're going to look at it over a few years. So again, if you're, um, if you're you know, let's just say making $50,000 a year, that's going to value the business at probably about $300,000, $350,000. Okay, so they're going to look at your profitability. And any person that's interested in investing or acquiring is going to be looking at your profitability over at least a three-year period. Okay, so understand you can't have like good near numbers one year, lousy numbers the next year, good numbers the next year. You gotta put together a few good years. They'll probably weight the most recent year heavier. Um, but I'm saying this because again, you gotta think about what it is you're trying to do. If that's not part of your plan, then it may not be something that you need to focus on. So um, just, and if we, Michael and I both mentioned in the beginning, we have both kind of um, climbed, o climbed over a certain wall. We've been through um, some exit strategies and um, here are a lot of common questions like what size do we need to be to be attractive to a buyer? Um, should I use a broker if I'm interested in selling my company, my agency? What kind of terms should I expect? Um, we want to cover those questions. We're running up against it on time. Hopefully no one maybe will kick us out if you want us to expound on some of these questions. But um, the really, one of the key um, thoughts we wanted to leave you with was just focus on what you can directly influence or control, right? Um, don't let um, tr selling your company be a distraction. You can't control who's going to win the next presidential election. You can't control if the economy is going to tank. There are things you can control like your attitude, your activity within the company, um, and have an influence over things like your culture. So that's what you should really focus on. And usually an exit is the byproduct of those things. Um, email is a really good way to reach us. If anyone would like these slides, all you have to do is email us. I don't know how, the, how it's going to work with the, I guess they're going to be posted in a few weeks, maybe on the website. But if you'd like a copy sooner, um, these are our emails. Um, Email us, ask us questions more if you have them around um, exit strategy um, scenarios. One of the best things I found about the Google community is because of open source and sharing, many of the business owners um, are fairly friendly. And many of us talk and we compare some of the projects and you know, chat about what's working and what's not. And I think that's great about the community. So Dave's always been very open to share. Um, is the next presenter here? Okay, so maybe uh, all right. Maybe we have a minute. Any questions we could try to fit in? EBITDA. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.